So the conversation between Brett Weinstein and Richard Dawkins has just come out. Uh, they had it in October and a lot of people were really looking forward to it and thinking it could be a really significant moment in evolutionary biology. I know that's how Brett was thinking about it. And by coincidence, I've just come back from doing a whole set of interviews with Brett and with Heather. And one of the things we talked about was the Dawkins debate. So in a minute, I'm going to play the whole of that interview with Brett. But I just wanted to frame it first because I know for Brett in particular, the point of difference, the disagreement that they had, is something he thinks has held up evolution since about the 1970s. My argument would be Dawkins' selfish gene was a triumph. It really would have a hard time having been better from the point of view of the amount of contribution in one small volume. But it did usher in a broken assumption that because we never fixed it has become the obstacle that I think my entire generation uh, now faces in, in the study of human evolution at least, and it's about time we fixed it. And I thought this little interaction right at the beginning of the debate uh, said a lot about the different perspectives that Brett and Richard Dawkins were taking into it. I'm going to play it quickly. Now, The Selfish Gene you wrote in 1976, am I correct about that? You were 35 years old? Yeah. So. Richard wrote that book as a young gun, and I find it shocking that I have to say this, but I think that that book is still cutting edge. And so one of the things we may end up talking about tonight is why it is that there has not been more progress after the huge burst of activity that we saw in the late 60s and early 70s, why uh, my era has been much quieter with respect to important discoveries about evolution that we all agree are true. Do um, you have anything to add? Yes, I, I don't quite know why you find it shocking. I mean, of course we all pay lip service to the idea that progress is good and we should be changing all the time, but what if we're right? And so um, it, do, it doesn't necessarily follow that, uh, that w what people thought in the 1960s and 70s is still largely believed is a bad thing. Maybe it is actually Right. So I'm going to play the whole interview with Brett now, but why I think this is really important is that this goes really to the heart of a lot of the key questions, particularly the utility of religion, therefore the new atheist framework that Dawkins is coming from. I'm going to let Brett examine it, explore it and describe it in his own words and play the whole interview now. Recently you had a very high profile conversation with Richard Dawkins in Chicago. How did it go? I think it went very well. Uh, it's a conversation I had been waiting to have literally for decades. In particular, I've been very interested to know what he would respond if a careful articulation of the idea that religion has to be an adaptation, that we should view the religious beliefs of populations that have held beliefs for thousands of years, we should look at them more or less as we look at an eye or a wing or any other phenomenon that has the hallmarks of adaptation, rather than looking at them as a mind virus, the way Dawkins has famously dismissed them. It has always seemed to me that if the proper argument was laid in front of him, that Dawkins being a famously honest broker as an intellectual, would have to acknowledge some reality to it. And I think we got closer to that than many people imagined would be possible. It was clear on stage that Dawkins was in tension with himself over his, uh, his beliefs. And on the one hand, when I pointed out that mind virus suggests that uh, these belief systems are pathological to the people who hold them, and that that is not only an unproductive way to approach people, but that it is at odds with the elegance of the way selection tends to work. He initially argued that people had overinterpreted the question of mind virus, and that really every gene in the genome could be portrayed in such a light, which is an argument I certainly understand. It's not the connotation people get when you say mind virus. I, I challenged him and I said, um, that 
the connotations when you say mind virus or that these people are mentally ill. And he protested. He said, well, they are mentally ill. So, you know, on the one hand, he was being, you know, the careful Dawkins that we remember from, you know, the mid-70s. And on the other hand, he was being the strident older Dawkins that gets himself into such trouble over religion. And both things were evident within, you know, a couple of sentences of each other. Because this, this question is right at the heart of new atheism, effectively. On stage, I told Dawkins that religion cannot be a mind virus. No, I don't want to go back. On stage, I told Dawkins that religions that have existed for thousands of years cannot be mind viruses, but that new atheism can. And I really believe this. New atheism is novel. It has not stood the test of time. And in fact, it creates a problem for many of us who might otherwise be willing to be called atheists because it has taken on uh, an ideological fervor rather than being a, uh, an argument that there is no supernatural explanation for the phenomena that we find within the universe. It has become a, uh, a challenge to people who view the universe otherwise. And that desire to challenge people rather than to challenge ideas is not helpful. Even if new atheism uh, began in a productive direction, it became so focused in doing battle on behalf of an idea that I think it just lost its way. And it, it ceased to be able to see that it had gone too far. That in fact, it is one thing to point out that religious traditions are not literal. It is another thing to argue that they are error, because that's not what they are. They are, they are much more than error. What's your definition of them? I mean, I've heard you say before that they are metaphorically true, but literally, literally false. My argument has been that religions are compendiums of a kind of wisdom, but that that wisdom is non-literal. So that when we evaluate the content of, let's say, a biblical text, we, if we look at it with respect to did these events occur, then we will dismiss it. If we say, what would the effect on an individual be of believing that these events had occurred, the effect would be positive from the point of view of their genetic fitness. That is to say, how well they are able to serve their genetic interests would be enhanced by believing in these structures. So, for example, if one behaves in life in such a way as to uh, make it more likely that one will go to heaven and make it less likely that one will end up in hell. It just so happens that behaving in that honorable way will cause your descendants to be well positioned in society, to be well thought of, to be treated well. Whereas if you betray people and act like a jerk, it's very likely that your descendants will experience a cost for your untrustworthiness. So it is no accident, I am arguing, that behaving so as to get you into heaven does not actually get you into a place called heaven, but it does get you into an analogous place in which your descendants are better off after your death. Their life is better after your death. It's a kind of life after death, but it's not literal. So guys like Dawkins are unable to see this kind of value, that is to say um, a pragmatic value of these belief systems because they are too caught up in evaluating the claims that are tied up in, uh, in these texts. So, in effect, they are missing the forest for the trees because the falseness of the literal claim obscures the value of belief in that claim. What effect has that had on evolutionary biology, for example? Evolutionary biology has been stuck. In my opinion, it has been stuck since about 1976, which is the year that Dawkins published The Selfish Gene as a 35-year-old young gun. The reason it has been stuck, especially with respect to understanding human beings, is that although Dawkins made a quantum leap in that book in the direction of a proper theory of human evolution, 
he also made an error that has gone um, unrepaired in the entire intervening period. When he introduced the concept of memes, thereby providing a mechanism for discussing cultural evolution in rigorous terms by analogy to genes, he argued that memes evolve as if in a new primeval soup. He uses that phrase. And were that the case, it basically suggests an independence of memetic products and the genetic underpinnings of our physical nature. If those two things are independent, then you could get things like religions that evolve to further their own interests at the expense of the creatures on whose minds they are running. That would make sense, given uh, his, his argument. If it is not correct that memes exist in a new primeval soup, then it is likely, and I argued on stage, that in fact cultural traits are obligated to serve genetic interests. So in such a context, a religion as mind virus makes no sense because what we can infer is that as much as people may believe things that are literally false, they are believing them for reasons that are apparently in the interests of their genomes. And that is where a proper theory of human evolution would have to go. So in essence, tied up in this one very small error is the entire branch of the tree that we should be exploring in order to understand ourselves as products of adaptive evolution. And more often than not in complex systems, when we get stuck, it is, it is something of this nature, where the tiniest alteration of an assumption has giant cascading effects. And very frequently, because of the way we pass on the tradition of studying these things, one generation creates an assumption that isn't quite right. It hands it off to the next generation who doesn't even realize that it's making an assumption at all. It takes on that assumption so early in, you know, the, in graduate study that nobody thinks to question it. And by the time that generation matures into uh, to teaching their own uh, intellectual descendants, it just has become part of the landscape. Therefore, the solution to fixing stuck fields very frequently involves doing exactly the opposite of what the mythology of science suggests. The mythology of science suggests you're sort of moving out on the frontier, looking farther. But when you're stuck, looking out on the frontier, you may be on an artificially short branch, you know, looking for leaves where there aren't any. When you, what you really need to do is go down the trunk of the tree and find the branching point, the place where you lost track of the argument and then follow another branch up. So going down, finding the broken assumption, and then traveling up another branch is, is the key to success. And my argument would be Dawkins' selfish gene was a triumph. It really would have a hard time having been better from the point of view of the amount of contribution in one small volume. But it did usher in a broken assumption that because we never fixed it has become the obstacle that I think my entire generation uh, now faces in, in the study of human evolution at least, and it's about time we fixed it. And if we did fix it, what would the effect be? Well, um, the effect would be spectacular and I think quite jarring to many people because what we tend to think when we think about ourselves as products of evolution is that somehow we have stepped off the end of the evolutionary tape, that we are Pleistocene hunter-gatherers living in modern world that doesn't look anything like uh, the savannas of Africa. But that's not in fact the case. The fact is evolution has been with us every step of the way, and while we are not adapted to the modern world. There's not been enough time with social media, for example, for us to have traditions that make any sense in that context. That is not true for things that are several hundred years old. So were we to understand just how much our culture and tradition has been serving our genomes, 
we would A, start to recognize that the study of evolution is much more central to understanding ourselves than we have given it credit for, and B, and this is the part I'm really hoping we can get to very quickly, B, we would realize that we are programmed, we are culturally programmed for something that cannot be defended, something we must resist. And that's a very jarring discovery, but from my perspective, the clock is ticking. We need to figure that out very quickly so that we can get on to um, reauthoring our purpose towards uh, objectives that actually match the values we think we hold. Our conscious minds need to reauthor our unconscious purpose so that we can uh, not simply um, be the um, be the slaves of an evolutionary purpose that is not honorable and will lead to our extinction. Can you make that a bit more explicit? What is that genetic program? Our genetic program is very simple. It has given us the identical purpose of every other evolved creature. And that identical purpose involves spreading our genetic spellings. People who believe in evolution will all resonate with that. What we don't typically say is that our genomes will spread our particular spellings to the exclusion of other spellings, even when the other spellings are better. So if, for example, I have a, a gene for a particular respiratory enzyme, and someone else has a gene that's 20% more efficient, well, that gene is better. But my respiratory gene will seek to displace, to drive to extinction that superior gene so that it may spread. That should give us a clue that something about this landscape is not simply about uh, progress. It is about progress in a very narrow sense that uh, is quite dangerous. In the larger case, individuals will advance their own genetic spellings by displacing individuals that are less likely to have them. That is to say, murder, genocide, warfare. These are all evolutionary processes, and we are wired to deploy them when we detect certain features of the landscape. And so we, we exist at this strange nexus. We are the most remarkable structures in the known universe the computing power that we have between our ears, and more importantly, the computing power that we can muster when we team up, is absolutely immense. And we are capable of um, breathtaking feats of insight and beauty. But all of these things evolved for this simple mind-numbing purpose that is no different from the purpose of uh, a malaria propagule, it's no different from the purpose of a liver fluke or a maple tree. It's all one purpose. To have this marvelous machinery set to such a uh, uninteresting objective, an uninteresting objective that in the human context results in all kinds of horror. The worst atrocities that humans are engaged in are evolutionary in their nature. For us to be wired for that objective is an appalling waste of our potential. We could, and in fact I believe we must, commandeer our own machinery and take it away from evolution's purpose and apply to it a purpose that makes sense. For example, we could architect, and mind you I'm speaking as somebody who thinks utopianism is the worst idea humans ever had but we could architect a world in which we had an abundant steady state, in which people's needs were met and they were free to engage in the production of meaning and beauty. It would not be a landscape perfectly free of competition. In fact, competition would be um, at the heart of such a landscape, but the competition would be towards something that actually produced benefits for people uh, as a regular consequence. Should we be doing that rather than figuring out which people are unable to defend themselves and making up excuses to displace them from the earth? I think we should. Um, but whether 
others will recognize in the elucidation of our evolutionary purpose, this obligation, that remains to be seen. And how does that repurposing or that broader perspective relate to the disagreement with Richard Dawkins? On stage, Dawkins expressed extreme reluctance about applying evolutionary theory to human beings. He was very uncomfortable with the idea of analyzing genocide, warfare, really history in an evolutionary context. This shocked me. Dawkins is the iconic evolutionary thinker. I would have said fearless. But to see him actually frightened that we would apply this logic in that context uh, really made me think. Now, I do not share all of his trepidations. I share some of them. I know that bad Darwinism results in atrocities. But Good Darwinism would be the cure for those atrocities. Recognizing that you are programmed for things that you, the conscious entity, do not believe you should be involved in um, leaves open the possibility of controlling those impulses. Seeing them coming is a far better protection than pretending they aren't there. So I'm not arguing that it is safe. Dawkins is right that it is dangerous, but it is not as dangerous as leaving these things unexplored. If we're going to move forward in history, the way we're going to do it is by understanding the deeper lessons and learning to protect ourselves from the patterns that otherwise reemerge and catch us by surprise. I just want to pick up on something that Brett said at the end there, which really reminds me of Jordan Peterson's concept of the shadow, that Brett is saying, if we're not aware that we have these programs, if we're not aware that we're monstrous, then we are doomed to play that out. It's very similar to what Peterson says about the shadow. If we don't realize that we're monsters, then we're much more likely to act that out in the world. And that also connects with something that Brett said a few times, which is that all true maps must align, which I find really, really interesting. Like the, the kind of Jungian psychology of Peterson, which is an archetypal mythological system, can align with evolutionary biology in the way that Brett's framing there. So next up, Brett may have another public debate coming up with another biologist called David Sloan Wilson, if Twitter is anything to go by. And he and I recorded another short film about that, trying to contextualize and explain why that's important, which you can see if you go to Brett's YouTube channel now. I'll put the link below this video. Here's a quick clip of that. There's an awful lot riding on the question of whether or not evolution takes place at the level of the group. This is dogged evolutionary biology since Darwin. So we also recorded another few pieces, including Brett's take on the Jordan Peterson-Sam Harris debates, which is also really fascinating. We'll be trying to get that up in the next few days. And we've got a load more interesting content coming up that we're trying to find time to edit. We've got Ian McGilchrist, we've got Heather Hying, we've got Stanislav Groff, and quite a few more and we're going to put that up on the main channel and we're also going to put on some Patreon exclusive pieces as well. So if you want to see all of that and to get access to a load more content, please do support us on Patreon and see you soon. <laughs>